forbidden policy concerning asylum seekers from Afghanistan. Welcome, Sana Beste. Thank you. Uh, very thankful to be invited here. Uh, FAR promotes asylum rights since 30 years and try to support asylum seekers and undocumented from all countries, not only Afghanistan. But those facing deportation to Afghanistan have been a large group now for several years. But my subject today, is this too near my... It's okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. My subject today is, what is the matter with Sweden? <laughs> <laughs> Recently, the UNHCR published new guidelines for Afghanistan. You have heard about that. They say, among other things, that those who can't return to the other parts of Afghanistan should not be referred to settle in Kabul. And the internal flight alternative is neither relevant nor reasonable. Just some days later, the Swedish Migration Agency announced that their guidance, like guidelines concerning Afghanistan don't need to be changed in this respect. The argument was that since the number of killed civilians is not higher in Kabul in the first half of 2018 than 2017, people can still be expelled there. You have already heard from Helen the, the statistics from uh, uh, European Union countries. Um, but and, uh, in the last year, 37% of the Afghans uh, being decided on in Sweden could stay. Last quarter, it was down to 32%. In 2014, at least two-thirds of the asylum seekers from Afghanistan were allowed to stay in Sweden. Now two-thirds get the decision to leave. But the security situation has not improved, right? Yeah. How come that Sweden suddenly seems unfriendly? Sweden historically has been at the lead when it comes to granting asylum uh, among comparable countries. One answer is that the friendliness is partly an illusion. A large part of the residence permits in Sweden had been granted after group assessments. Through the, through the years, uh, decisions on length of stay, child decisions, and the extra reviews of certain categories have resulted in large group of asylum seekers being allowed to stay. Still, Sweden was never a soft country for those who have to rely on individual examination of the threats they fear. For them, the demands of proof are unreasonably high. For example, the protection assessment is often a matter of identity, or rather the ID documents. Um, you must prove that you are a specific person and that this specific person is in danger of future perse persecution. This is not easy when all available ID documents are deemed to be of too low quality to prove anything. Uh, of course, uh, it also happens that the authorities make an assessment about a specific country where anyone can suffer from indiscriminate violence. Then the credibility of the individual doesn't matter. But coming from a country where the armed conflict is not considered that widespread, like in Afghanistan, you must show individual reasons. Those who get decisions today have a different background than those who get decisions uh, some years ago. The big part of the asylum seekers from Afghanistan who I interviewed in 2013 fled from bloody conflicts around land, forced marriages, um, or had worked with foreigners. And most of them were families with children. Today, bigger share are single males, many of them young, and today many have grown up in Iran or Pakistan. They too escaped conflicts, but many years ago, and the conflict was rather their parents. Single men and couples without children can seldom get protection in Sweden, because even if they could prove the danger, there is most, most often an internal flight alternative. But today, the internal flight alternative often is not even tested at all, because if you have grown up abroad and can't prove any place of origin inside Afghanistan, then, strangely enough, the whole country is considered uh, your origin. And therefore, there is no internal flight 
evaluate. The asylum seekers' different background is one reason for the low share of protection recognitions. But lots of them still have personal reasons. Seeming, seemingly, it has become more difficult even for them. Persons suffering from physical injuries or post-traumatic syndromes are told that as you can't prove that your enemy still will bother about you, you can safely return. The burden of proof is also very high on converts, LGBT people, or those trying to escape honor-related persecution. There has also been major changes in the attitude towards unaccompanied children. Five years ago, the big majority could get permanent residence just because they had no relatives to receive them. Today, they face expulsion when they turn 18, many of them after unscientific age assessments. If still in asylum procedure, the young ones are kicked out of youth homes or foster care, some of them sleeping rough, to be able to at least stay in school in the town where they were living. The young single asylum seekers still often have a network. Foster families, guardians and teachers know them and fight for them. At the same time, young male asylum seekers are demonized in public opinion and suspicion characterize the asylum interrogations. The reasons for such changes is not a find in Afghanistan, it's a matter of Sweden. We have a growing populist party making all politicians compete about who is most tough on foreigners and the authorities follow suit. Shouldn't the security situation in Afghanistan mean something? Well, it mostly doesn't, because asylum seekers typically can't get protection because of the general security situation at all. There must be a personal reason. The migration agents rely on low death tolls. The bombings are not dangerous to anyone. But I think they misjudge the security situation because protection needs is not only about undiscriminate war, it is also about discriminatory violence and vulnerability. Even without immediate personal threat, you could be in danger by being from abroad, without network, being Hazara, being sheep, being westernized, wearing a tattoo on your neck and the wrongful music still in your pocket not being welcome anymore to share your family's properties. Without knowing how to behave or where to turn to support yourself, you will probably end up in dangerous situations. The UNHCR report is also about this. It doesn't only show death toll, but also how the Taliban take power increasingly and how the insurgents nowadays systematically attack civilians. The retinue to the countryside risk harmful treatment under parallel legal systems and with a suspicion to support foreigners. If he stays in Kabul or another of the big cities and try to manage as a day tailor, he sure will be present in deadly zones without protection, as the UNHCR points out. UNHCR, it, it's not an extreme activist group. And they are not opposed to voluntary return. Hundreds of thousands return from Iran and Pakistan with their help. When the UNHCR says that the situation is impossible in Kabul, the migration agency should listen. By the way, you will find the, the analysis of the, the UNHCR report at the FAR website in some days. Look for it. There has been a lot of anger in Sweden of young ones born in Sweden who will leave to join ISIS, becoming terrorists. At the same time, we deport other young ones to persecution or recruitment by terrorists. It doesn't make sense. Many people do return. And of course, millions in Afghanistan live without any intention to leave. I sincerely wish their struggle will end in a better future. But I don't think they are helped by forced expulsions who the government can't help. 
Afghanistan needs assistance and has largely agreed to the returns from the European Union. But the specific readmission agreement that Sweden concluded with Afghanistan was refused by the Afghan parliament because it includes forced expulsions of people who Afghanistan can't take responsibility for. The most of the uh, young Afghans have got, uh, a big part of them have got uh, expulsion decisions. Most of, of them will not be forcibly deported. They will end up as undocumented in Europe. It's a very bad investment. Still, deportations are executed sometimes by surprise, sometimes by violence. We are very thankful to Mr. Abdul Ghafoor who helped some of them when no one else does. In fact, when deportations are stopped, it could be new reasons, smart lawyers, or by UN committees, but rather often by Afghan officers denying entrance for minors, split families, and some others. It is good, but awful too. Should Sweden's deportations rely on who is deportable? Shouldn't that be a more reliable risk assessment? Farr's opinion is that Sweden should not use its economic advantage to force Afghanistan to receive more persons expelled by force. We urge the government to revoke the readmission agreement with Afghanistan. And we urge the Migration Agency to make a new assessment and stop the forced expulsions. One more thing. I explained before that if it wasn't for all occasions when decision makers have been forced to take group decisions, Sweden would not have such a reputation of being generous. Uh, every time this happened, there has been a public opinion behind. Now, 2018, it happened again when some thousands of the young ones from Afghanistan are given an extra chance to stay if they attend senior secondary school. This is not enough, but it means that you, the civil society, including asylum seekers, is important. You are all part of it, and we will continue the fight for asylum rights. Thank you for listening and doing this. Thank you very much. Uh -huh, okay. If you want, yeah. Is there a question for Sana? Everything is said. Okay, that's, that's <laughs> Thank you very much.